Abbas the Great of Persia. Abbas I, styled the Great, Shah or King of Persia of the Safavid dynasty, the first Safavid monarch to create a standing army, won back substantial territory lost under his predecessors to the Uzbeks and the Ottoman Turks. Although a just and courageous ruler whose reign was distinguished by its high artistic level, he tarnished his reputation by the murder and mutilation of many members of his family. Early Years The third son of Sultan Muhammad Shah, Abbas was born on January the 27th, 1571, and came to the throne in October 1588, at a critical moment in the fortunes of the Safavid dynasty. The weak rule of his semi-blind father had allowed the tribal emirs, or chiefs, of the Turkmen tribes, who had brought the Safavids to power and still constituted the backbone of the Safavid military strength, to usurp the authority of the Shah. Moreover, the intertribal factionalism of these Turkmens, known as Kizilbash, or Redheads, because of the distinctive red headgear they had adopted to mark their adherence to the Safavids, had so weakened the state that its traditional enemies, the Ottoman Turks to the west and the Uzbeks to the east, had been able to make large inroads into Persian territory. Shah Abbas thus had two immediate tasks to restore internal security and reassert the authority of the monarchy, and to expel Ottoman and Uzbek troops from Persian soil. Since he was unable to fight a war on two fronts simultaneously, in 1589 to 1590 he signed a peace treaty with the Ottomans, thus freeing himself for an offensive against the Uzbeks. By the treaty, large areas in the west and northwest Persia were ceded to the Ottomans. Despite the breathing space thus gained, Abbas for ten years was unable to launch a major offensive against the Uzbeks, and Iran suffered further loss of territory both to the Uzbeks and to the Mughals of India. The delay was caused by Abbas's decision to create a standing army a concept novel to Safavid kings, who traditionally levied armies in time of need from the tribal cavalry. The creation of a standing army immediately caused a budgetary problem, because the old tribal cavalry had been paid from the revenues of the provinces governed by Kizilbash chiefs. Abbas solved the problem in the short term by bringing a number of these provinces directly under the control of the Shah. The taxes in these new crown provinces were remitted to the royal treasury. In the long run, the inevitable result of this policy, the reduction in the numbers of Kizilbash troops, seriously weakened the country's military strength. The new standing army was composed mainly of Georgians, Armenians, and Circassians, who had been brought to Persia as prisoners during the reign of Abbas's grandfather and their descendants. After their conversion to Islam, they were trained for service either in the army or in the administration of the state or the royal household. Shah Abbas felt he could rely on the loyalty of these gulams, slaves of the Shah as they were known and he used them to counterbalance the influence of the Kizilbash, whom he distrusted. Gulams soon rose to high office and were appointed governors of crown provinces. Eventually, Abbas was able to take the offensive against his external foes. In 1598, he inflicted a major defeat on the Uzbeks and regained control of Khorasan. From 1602 onward, he conducted a series of successful campaigns against the Ottomans and recovered the territory lost to them. After his great victory over the Uzbeks, Abbas transferred the capital from Kazvin to Isfahan. Under his guidance, Isfahan rapidly became one of the most beautiful cities in the world. 
He adorned the city with many mosques and theological colleges, and constructed numerous caravansaries and public baths. He laid out the city with spacious boulevards and a splendid square. The Shah's building energies were not confined to Isfahan. The extension and restoration of the famous shrine at Meshed and the construction, along with the swampy littoral of the Caspian Sea, of the celebrated stone causeway designed to give access to his favorite winter retreats were among his most notable achievements. To the new capital at Isfahan came ambassadors from European countries, merchants seeking to establish trade relations, representatives of foreign monastic orders seeking permission to found convents at Isfahan and elsewhere, and gentlemen of fortune such as the brothers Sir Anthony and Sir Robert Shirley, the former an adventurer, the latter a loyal servant of the Shah who distinguished himself in the wars against the Ottomans. The reign of Shah Abbas was a period of intense commercial and diplomatic activity, and, in the Persian Gulf, the Portuguese, the Dutch, and the English strove to make themselves masters of trade there and in the Indian Ocean. Abbas's reign also marks a peak of Persian artistic achievement. Under his patronage, carpet weaving became a major industry and fine Persian rugs began to appear in the homes of wealthy European burghers. Another profitable export was textiles, which included brocades and damasks of unparalleled richness of color and intricacy and freedom of design. The production and sale of silk was made a monopoly of the crown. In the illumination of manuscripts, bookbinding, and ceramics, the work of the period of Abbas is without equal, in painting, it is among the most notable in Persian history. Shah Abbas was a courageous and energetic man, and a ruler with a passionate zeal for justice and the welfare of his subjects. He frequented tea houses and other meeting places of the ordinary people in order to learn of extortion and oppression on the part of his officials. His punishment of corrupt officials was swift. He showed unusual religious tolerance, granting privileges to many Christian groups. The dark side of his character was reserved for his own sons and members of his own family. The experiences of his youth, when he was marked for execution by his uncle, Shah Ismail II, had left him with a morbid fear of conspiracy. Originally, he followed the practice of his predecessors in appointing the princes of the blood royal as provincial governors, but after a series of revolts and intrigues in favor of his sons, the royal princes were confined to the harem, where their only companions were women and eunuchs. As his obsessive fear of assassination increased, Abbas began to put to death or to blind any member of the royal family who caused him anxiety in this regard. In this way, one son was executed, an act that caused Abbas bitter remorse, and two were blinded, and his father and brothers were blinded and imprisoned. Abbas died on January the 19th, 1629, without an heir capable of succeeding him. Though Abbas possessed great stature as a monarch, even in an age notable for its outstanding rulers, his great achievement in first saving the Safavid Empire from collapse and then raising it to new heights of splendor is marred by his treatment of his own family and the fact that his reforms contained within them the seeds of the future decay of both dynasty and state. Bibliography L. L. Bellin, Shah Abbas I, Sa vie son histoire, 1932, the only biography of Shah Abbas I in any European language, generally accurate. R. M. Savory, Abbas I, in the Encyclopedia of Islam, New Edition, Volume 1, pages 7 to 8, 1960. For general background to the period of Shah Abbas, the reader is referred to J. Chardin, 
Voyages du Chevalier Chardin, 4th edition, 4th volume of 1811. Sir John Malcolm, The History of Persia from the Early Period to the Present Time, Volume 2, 1815. And V. Minorsky, Tadkirat al Mulak, 1943, especially the introduction, commentary, and appendices.